Well, hello, friends of Camp Spalding. My name is Josh Lyon. I teach theology at Whitworth University, specifically courses in New Testament, especially the Gospels. I teach uh, in our graduate program in theology as well as uh, direct the Core 150 program. And our family, we are longtime fans of Camp Spalding, and I am grateful to be joining you today to think about the life of Christ, what it means for us to be followers of Christ, especially in this very strange time in which we're living. Uh, today, to get to the point, I'd really like for us to think about a passage in Luke chapter 12. So if you have your Bible, open up to Luke chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 34. 13 through 34, Luke chapter 12. And um, <clears throat> we're going to see how these sort of three passages are interrelated with one another. And I want us to spend a few brief minutes reflecting on how these three passages actually direct our attention in three ways. In the first passage, in the parable, we're going to see Jesus direct our attention to ourselves, something in us he wants us to pay attention to. In the second passage about anxiety, he's going to draw our attention to something about God the Father. And in the third passage, he's going to draw our attention to others around us. So there's three things, something about ourselves, something about the Father, and something about others around us. So let's read this passage and reflect on it together. This is Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Don't be, uh, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. He said, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. He thought to himself, What shall I do? For now I have nowhere to store my crops. He said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store in all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to myself, Self, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your very life is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So Jesus said to his disciples, For this reason I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food. The body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour or cubit to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about all the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... How much more will he clothe you, O little faith ones? Do not seek what you are to eat, what you are to drink, and don't be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, but your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure, it is pleasing to your Father, to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Provide yourselves with treasures or money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So just a few things to think about here together. In the parable, right there back at the beginning, verses 13 through 21, Jesus calls us to reflect on something about ourselves. Notice that it, from one point of view, what the man does is entirely logical. He has a great crop. He wants to prepare for his future. So what does he do? He stores them up in bigger barns. He's a thoughtful human being. He knows that life is scary. Life can be unpredictable. You never know when a virus is going to break out or how long it's going to last. So why not store up his goods for a long time? And yet... He factors out the two most important things, his mortality and God. 
he factors out the fact that he is finite and that he should allow his finitude, the fact that he is a creature who will die, to reshape what he prioritizes in the present. That in fact, if he were to live in light of the fact that he were mortal, maybe that would at least open up a space for him to reconsider what really matters. Maybe a life oriented towards God and toward my neighbor would matter. But secondly, and relatedly, and perhaps even more importantly, he factors out God. Did you notice in the parable, the only voice that this man hears is his own. It's, it's a monologue. He doesn't consult his family, he doesn't consult his friends, and he certainly doesn't consult God. He realizes his situation, he has all these goods, and what does he do? He simply talks to himself. And what does his self tell him? Well, the most reasonable thing to do would be to keep yourself safe and secure, take control of your world. And so that is what he does. But he factors out the divine perspective, God's economy, God's presence, God's will, God's provision, God's graciousness to him plays no role in the actual concrete decisions he makes in his life. And as a result, what happens? This man's life ends up amounting to not much more than one massive attempt to insulate himself from the vicissitudes and suffering of life. Jesus then moves on to this next teaching. And what he says about anxiety is, of course, closely related to what he's just said about the rich fool. Notice he says in verse 20, uh, 22, he says, for this reason, don't be overly anxious. He connects it very closely. Now, what's the point here? Notice he's, he's called his audience from focusing on something internal, the, our tendency to grasp for things, to cling to things that make us feel safe. And now he's trying to pry their hands open from grasping those things to opening up them up towards God. So he moves the perspective from internal to external and upward toward God. And he paints a picture of the Father. Now, we should remember that as Jesus focuses us on the Father, and he talks about how the Father provides for us, Jesus is not a naive optimist. Jesus lived in the first century uh, where there was poverty, tyranny, civil unrest. He lived his own entire life in light of the fact that from a human perspective, he would die a premature death um, at the hands of injustice. So he's not a naive optimist just saying, oh, don't worry, be happy, God will take care of you. This is not a Hallmark card. Rather, what he's trying to do is refocus his audience's attention. What do you gaze upon primarily? Is your gaze first and most intensely upon the Father revealed in his Son who loves you, who cares you, and who cares for you in life and in death, who will never abandon you in life or in death? Or is your focus first and most intensely upon your situation in life? If it's the latter, it makes sense for us to be terrified. Life is terrifying. That's why one of the most common commands in the Bible is don't be afraid. I am with you, precisely because the Bible knows that life is terrifying. So what Jesus is doing here is drawing his audience's attention, sort of prying their gaze off of those things that cause anxiety and first directing it to God, the God revealed in Jesus, who is our Father. And as we gaze first and most intensely upon God the Father revealed in his Son, it changes the way we gaze upon other things. It's not that we don't have concerns. It's not that we don't have responsibilities. Jesus will talk plenty about that at other parts in the gospel. Um, but as a way of giving us a new posture, a new way of seeing our situation, he turns our attention to the Father. Notice, though, that lastly, he sort of moves from the internal, focusing on our our perhaps tendency to cling to things that make us feel safe, to moving to this external and upward focus on God the Father revealed in Jesus himself, to then turning us to an external focus. Because our gaze is first and most intensely on the Father revealed in the Son, then that is not just sort of a way of making us feel warm and fuzzy, or peaceful, or I don't have to worry. Now, of course, it is. It's a peace that transcends understanding, Paul says in Philippians 4. But it's not just to give us sort of a personal existential experience of peace. It's a call to action. Because that is true, notice what he says in verse 32 and 33. It's the call from the external and vertical gaze to the Father, now to the horizontal gaze to one another. Verse 32, fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So he re reframes life as gift, 
and it's given to you, but it's given to you and to me to steward. Verse 33, sell your possessions, give to the needy, treasure up for yourself treasures that don't grow old, he says. So it's not just to make us feel good, but it's in fact to bring to reality the very world or the very reality that Jesus paints the picture of. He says, don't be anxious, God the Father will provide for you. And then he calls his disciples to give up their goods. That is to say that for Jesus, his vision of reality is brought to fruition, first of all, in his own life, but second of all, in the community that he creates, a community that, in fact, is generous to one another, and therefore there is no need among one another. Uh, Luke is careful to paint a clear picture of this in his second volume, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, where he shows the early Christian community actually living this reality. He says in Acts chapter 2 and 4 that there, in fact, is no needy person among them because they are selling their possessions and giving to those who have need. Their gaze is first of all upon the Father revealed in the Son, and that radically reorients the way they live in relation to one another. That is to say, to sort of sum it up, Jesus' description of reality is first to be found in the people called by his name. I hope that um, you will go back and meditate on this passage, um, that you will find places in it that it's both encouraging you to rest in the Father's care for you, uh, also calling you and me to action, to find creative ways to be generous and gracious to one another in this strange time of the virus? How could we as the church perhaps even learn in this time where many of us uh, are, feel like our lives are in a very precarious situation, what would it be like for us to live even more open-handedly, to give not out of our plenty, but even out of our need, like the widow in Luke and Mark's gospel? Well, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And I look forward to the day when we can once again be together at Camp Spalding.